This learning happens everywhere approach is a core priority of the campaign for grade level readings post pandemic civic action and advocacy agenda. We know that school children spend less than 20% of their waking hours in school. We also know that the pandemic significantly disrupted learning and exacerbated longstanding disparities. Now more than ever, all of us who care about children's early school success need to look for opportunities to accelerate equitable learning recovery. Inside of schools and classrooms, yes, but also in the many places across the community where children and families frequent. The laundry mats, bus stops, libraries, playgrounds, barber shops, waiting rooms, museums, houses of worship, and the list goes on and on and on, and can be tailored to a local community and its landscape and assets. So I'm delighted to, uh, to be joined today by a panel of incredible philanthropic leaders who will share what this learning happens everywhere approach can look like in a community, why they made the choice to invest in this approach, the types of roles that they are playing to engage with and support local partners in embedding learning in these this wide range of places, the results that these efforts are having, and what they are learning in the process. And to begin that conversation, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our panel for today. First, we have Amanda Charles. Amanda is a program officer in great learning at the William Penn Foundation in Philadelphia, where she manages a grant-making portfolio focused on building literacy-rich environments for our youngest learners, including opportunities for children to build literacy skills outside of schools. Welcome also to Beth Duda. Since 2015, Beth has led the Suncoast Campaign for Grade Level Reading, a four-county effort in Florida's Suncoast region that is based at the, at the Patterson Foundation. Beth works closely with other local funders to engage cross-sector partners in promoting children's literacy, most recently by leading a year-long planning effort that culminated in more than 300 events across the four-county uh, four region over 10 days during Remake Learning Days. I'm also excited to welcome Perry Chinalai to the conversation. Perry is Managing Director of Program Strategy and Innovation at Too Small to Fail, the Early Childhood Initiative of the Clinton Foundation, where she oversees partnerships with locally based nonprofits, state and government agencies, corporations, and national organizations in promoting children's early brain and language development, including through Talking is Teaching, Talk, Read, Sing campaigns. And welcome also to Eric Gukan. Eric is the CEO of the United Way of the Greater Triangle based in Durham, North Carolina, a funder of book harvest efforts to help families harvest books and literacy activities wherever they go in the community. Eric has deep expertise in education as well, having begun his career as an elementary school science teacher and later leading Teach for America North Carolina and serving as a senior education advisor to the governor of North Carolina. And rounding out our group of presenters for today, I'm happy to welcome Brian Stokes. Brian serves as Education Portfolio Di Director at Robert M. McCormick Foundation in Chicago, Illinois, where he leads the foundation's investments in programs and initiatives serving children birth through kindergarten. Before joining McCormick, Brian served as an early learning educator, as Chief of Early Childhood Education at Chicago Public Schools, and also worked to build a universal preschool system in Chicago. And to guide us through today's conversation, I'm excited to welcome Jane Park. Jane is a senior content strategist for Google Kids and Families, where she is leading efforts to create high quality online experiences for children and families around the world. She previously serves as the director of the Clinton Foundation's Too Small to Fail initiative, where she led partnerships with corporations, nonprofits, and associations to scale a national public awareness and action campaign designed to promote children's early brain and language development. So welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you for joining us today, and I'll pass it over to you, Jane. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And a big warm welcome to everyone here with us today. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us and hear from um, just some incredible leaders who have been doing uh, truly transformative work to spark learning in everyday spaces. In my previous role with Too Small to Fail, uh, the Early Child Initiative of the Clinton Foundation, I was so inspired and energized by all the creative approaches to create learning-rich environments in communities all across the country. 
I'll never forget the faces of kids just walking into a playful, uh, learning rich laundromat, playground, barbershop, um, hospital waiting areas, even family courts, um, and just seeing how their faces lit up as they noticed that they, they entered this unexpected space really designed specifically for them. Um, and hearing from parents just how welcomed and, and supported they felt in their role. Um, and over the years, and I'm sure our panelists can attest to this, um, we've seen not just these faces of, of joy um, and appreciation from the parents, but also evidence that these approaches are working to transform the way kids and families are interacting, playing, talking, reading, and singing together um, in these spaces. And we need support from all sectors to scale what's working and to keep innovating in this space. Um, so today, we're so fortunate to have some great examples of the ways in which philanthropy can embrace the idea that learning can and should be supported community-wide. Um, and to set the stage for today's conversation, I'd like to invite each of, each of our panelists to give us a quick high-level introduction to uh, where your foundation is working, what your efforts look like, and then we'll dig deeper into um, really just the power of this approach and the roles that philanthropy can play. All right, so let's uh, go in alphabetical order here. Amanda, hi, Amanda. Amanda, hi. you're with, the, hello. You're with the William Penn Foundation in Philadelphia. Um, what do your efforts to promote literacy rich environments look like out there? Thanks, Jane. And thank you to the campaign for inviting me to be here today. Um, next slide. In Philadelphia, the William Penn Foundation has supported a variety of pilot projects that create learning and opportunities for children and families in public spaces and neighborhoods. This change is happening citywide in barbershops, grocery stores, public transit, laundromats, neighborhood libraries, parks, recreation centers, health clinics, affordable housing, and even waiting rooms. We support two strategies for creating literacy-rich environments in Philadelphia. Next slide. The first strategy focuses on creating physical equipment or as we like to call it, stuff that is active, engaging, content rich and likely to facilitate children's development and literacy skill building. For example, with funding from the foundation, Kaboom's Play Everywhere Philly Challenge awarded 2 million to create 26 playful learning projects designed by community organizations. The community organizations worked with the Play for Learning Landscapes Action Network to ensure that the designs contain elements that facilitate adult-child interactions. For example, at the bus stop in the bottom right, there is a puzzle wall, which you can kind of see on the left, that helps children develop math and spatial skills. The installation on the top right that we call the nest contains prompts to help children tell their own story, along with a little free library so children can sit and read an older sibling or caregiver. Next slide. In addition to physical stuff, we also support literacy focused programming that takes place outside of school in communities, in spaces such as public parks, museums, libraries, and even laundromats. For example, the foundation supports Fab Youth Philly, an organization that trains teens to be play captains who lead fun, engaging, literacy-focused games and activities for young children in their neighborhood parks throughout the summer. We also partnered with Perry and the Too Small to Fail team to transform three laundromats in Philadelphia into literacy-rich spaces. Then we recruited local community members who are trained to be reading captains to help activate those laundromats. They led story times, talked with children, and helped families connect to resources, such as how to register for kindergarten. If you're interested in learning more, I'd be happy to chat with you, but thank you for inviting me to be here today. Thank you, Amanda. This is wonderful. Thank you for, for sharing all these wonderful examples. Um, Perry, I'd love to hand it over to you. I know the Clinton Foundation is, is an operating foundation, but can you give us a quick overview of where and how you're working to promote early literacy in communities? Sure, and um, thank you so much for inviting um, me to come today and to talk a little bit about our work. So Too Small to Fail um, began over 10 years ago, It really in response to studies that show that almost 60% of children in the United States start kindergarten unprepared. Um, 
And, you know, we wanted to look at how to boost their critical language, math, social emotional skills, and really, you know, thinking about how critically important the first five years of children's lives are, particularly those first three, um, mm -hmm. where they're building all those neural connections, we really set out to support parents and caregivers in talking, reading and singing to their children wherever they are. So the goal for our program has always been to make um, this programming as easy on parents as possible. So we think about the everyday moments and routines and that really any time could be a magical moment um, for, for learning. Um, so that could be diaper time or bedtime or bath time on the bus. Um, you're you know talking, you're looking and pointing to things. So how do we make those small moments really, really big? Because what we know about the brain science is that those moments are really big. So how can we amplify them? Um, so our program works nationally. Um, we are so proud to collaborate with a really diverse network of organizations and companies and institutions from across the country that are all committed to supporting parents and caregivers. And we have three central strategies that you can see here. Um, it's people, places, and resources. So first, um, we'll just talk about trusted messengers um, on the next slide. The, Two small to fails, um, you know, one of our first key strategies is really to work with um, whoever it is in the community that parents and caregivers go to and trust um, when it comes to parenting advice, when it comes to life advice, when they learn about the importance of engaging with children um, and, I, and, you know, get ideas on how to engage, who are they most likely to hear those messages from? So for us, we've worked very closely with pediatricians, pastors, other faith-based leaders, to, you know, um, to work with them to embed some of these early learning messages um, into the work that they're already doing. We've, we've worked with home visitors, WIC clinicians, librarians. There's really a whole range of people that we would consider to be these kind of amazing community ambassadors. And um, what we find is that when there is a trusted messenger um, to really help parents engage, it provides kind of that stickiness, um, you know, to those messages. Our second strategy focuses on space transformation. So um, a little bit of what you had shared earlier around where is it that families are going every day? Um, we know that parents and caregivers are busy. So we set out to try and meet them wherever it is in the spaces that they're already going with young children, um, whether it be the laundromat, the playground, the trans you know, transportation. Um, and you know, so what we do is you can see here in this picture, transform these spaces to be learning rich environments, um, as Amanda was saying, with books, bookshelves, seating areas, posters. Um, and this, there's another um, space transformation here, which you could see that we did in Napa, California. Um, and then the last resource, uh, the last uh, strategy that we, that we really use and think about is the tools to facilitate change. So we know, you know, it's really important to make sure that Books are in the hands of children and in their home libraries. Um, and so we distribute um, lots of books, uh, lots of objects that enhance their social emotional development um, and um, and also materials that encourage talking, reading, singing or prompts on them. So you'll have onesies that, um, you know, that say talk to me or let's talk about um, any number of topics. Um, and then just lastly, in addition to our three strategies, we think a lot about media and the role that media can play to kind of help um, uh, create that echo chamber of early learning messages and um, the importance of talking, reading, singing. So you'll see some billboards, you'll see signage and bus stops. Um, and we try to do all three of these strategies plus media in the communities that we engage with. And our last slide really just shows um, some of the areas and cities that we uh, work in nationally our partners are these kind of amazing champions that are serving families in a variety of different ways and incorporating these strategies in very innovative, customized ways that serve their community best. Thank you, Perry. As you were talking, I, I wrote down one of your quotes. Any, any moment could be a magical moment, not just learning rich, but magical. And, and We've certainly seen seen those faces and just that that spirit in in these in some of these spaces that you described. Um, thank you for sharing all these wonderful examples, uh, Beth. Um, I have seen you in action. Uh, we have 
been together at events before, so really nice to see you here today. Um, you're with the United Way of the Greater Triangle. I'm sorry, you are with Remake Learning Day. <laughs> I know you just wrapped up Remake Learning Day is an incredible community-wide series of events in Florida's Sun Coast region. Congratulations. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that effort and others that the Patterson Foundation supports throughout the year to promote learning in everyday spaces? It's good to see you. Great to be here today. So I, my title is the director of the Suncoast Campaign for Grade Level Reading. We're a four county initiative in Florida in Charlotte, DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota counties. And we're look, looking at how we can build an ecosystem of support so that our children thriving becomes something that our entire community is focused on rather than it being something that just schools or, or pre-K uh, centers are, are involved in. So as we have been building this movement on the Sun Coast, one of the um, things that we actually learned about in one of these webinars is Remake Learning Days. It started in Pittsburgh with uh, Remake uh, Learning uh, the, and the Grable Foundation. And when we first heard about it, we thought it would be a wonderful way for us to really garner community support around family and parent engagement. So Remake Learning Days is where uh, hands-on learning opportunities for families take place across our region. Every event uh, was free and open to the public and provided an opportunity for parents and children to learn side by side. We started in 2022 um, with a 10-day festival. We had 150 events our first year and about 10,000 people in attendance, which we were thrilled with, but we knew we could do better. And in uh, 2023, um, we had 204 events over 10 days with 25,000 people in attendance. Um, so we actually expanded this year to a 15 day festival, which allowed us to have three Saturdays. And we um, had 304 family friendly free events happen across the, the region with attendance of more than 36,000 people. So we were just thrilled with the, the participation. Um, Remake Learning Days events happen with different themes. There's the arts, maker spaces, outdoor learning, science, technology, youth voice and with a professional development component. And we had a range of activities. Um, one of my favorites, you can go to the next slide. You, you can see the helicopter here. This was a, a forestry helicopter that landed on the grounds of one of our public housing communities. So children and families were able to get in the helicopter. It was a firefighting helicopter. So they learned about firefighting as well as about aviation. And then there were many community partners there that had hands-on activities for the families that dealt with aviation. Up at the, the top, you can see a, a white bus and it's a, an organization that actually allows you to paint the bus. So when it comes um, to the site, it's completely white. And then throughout the day, families and children are allowed to paint uh, the entire bus and pictures are taken. It was a, a really great way for families to interact together. And I think all of Remake Learning Days give parents the opportunities to see their children in a light that perhaps they haven't seen before. Some of our events are quite large and some uh, quite small. We had some events that happened at schools where we had, you know, thousands of people that attended and others at libraries where maybe it was 30 to 50 people. Um, we work with the, the communities and the, our event hosts to make sure that they are all trained in program content and how to market to the size audience that they want. So Remake Learning Days has actually become a year long activity for us to convene and gather and uh, learn from each other. So very joyful. Um, one other thing that, that we do to ensure that we're uh, turning everyday spaces into learning spaces is we too are involved in laundromat um, work. We host something that we call pop-up neighbor through laundry events. Uh, and we do it about 12 times a year where we actually take over a laundromat 
for five hours on a Saturday. Everyone who walks through the door has all of their laundry fees paid. And we have community partners there with us, like the health department or the food bank, the libraries, to make sure that the, the families are having an opportunity to engage with some of the organizations that might they might not have even known um, we're around. So we're uh, very excited about the work and are, are looking forward to continuing to grow. Wonderful. Thank you, Beth. I can only imagine the face of the kids stepping into a helicopter or like painting a real bus. I notice it said honk in the back. <laughs> so fun and joyful. Thank you. Um, Eric, love to uh, hand it over to you now. You're you're with the United Way of Greater Triangle in North Carolina, uh, where you support some of the great work of Book Harvest and, and other organizations. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what those efforts look like? Absolutely, and thanks, Jane. Um, I am here uh, repping Book Harvest, uh, one of our very favorite organizations. Um, every community, I live in Durham, North Carolina, uh, I'm actually at my house right now, and uh, if you go down the street, there is a laundromat, and it is a book harvest laundromat. If you go to the common market, want to get a sandwich, there's there's a book harvest presence there. Uh, if you go uh, to get your kids uh, swim lessons at the swim club, there's a book harvest presence there. I love what Beth said about the entire community, and um, that is really what book harvest is all about. Um, our mission at United Way is to invest in community-driven solutions that advance racial and economic justice. And we have a stubborn belief, and I know it's an impossible vision by, by, by many people's evaluation, but we have a stubborn belief that we can eradicate poverty and increase social mobility through the power of partnerships. And there is no greater partner that we have than Book Harvest. Um, they are uh, in lockstep with our values, and you see them there. Um, and they, they incorporate a lot of the same strategies that you heard uh, my colleagues talk about. Um, but I, I'm just here to attest, uh, you know, we've invested uh, close to a million dollars over two, since, uh, since 2015 into Book Harvest directly, over $25 million into the community since the pandemic. And um, they really embody uh, what it is that a truly community organization is uh, working across lines of difference. This isn't about other people's children, it is about everyone's children. Um, and everyone in, the, in Durham, I'm as a parent <laughs> here to attest, uh, you cannot go anywhere without seeing a Book Harvest's presence and um, in the community and uh, Tabitha uh, Blackwell uh, and, and Ginger Young, the founder, um, we just had the pleasure of having lunch with them recently. And I said, what is it that you all like, wh what's your secret? And they, they both looked me dead in the eye and they said, this is about a lifestyle. And it is, this is not a program. This is about a lifestyle and, and literacy is, is literally for everyone and for every child. And you, you feel it as you walk through the, uh, everywhere in Durham. Um, and, and that is uh, a big part of, uh, you can see the numbers here, um, they're impressive. Um, and the first thing that Ginger Young would say, and Tabitha as well, is, is the books are are a totem to get you to the to the real thing, which is which is the which is the the literacy, and um, and of course the, all the great things that happen um, when you're reading by third grade, and all what all the data shows. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. We already covered that. Great. Um, and and I you know these are just concrete examples uh, the laundromats the book book hubs the family space and the story walk um, I'll let you all read those but those these are the the things that as I mentioned are just infiltrated throughout um, and and the, the the sort of crown jewel uh, and, and and sort of the proof positive similar to what um, some of my colleagues were talking about is. They have a dream big event on MLK, and literally everyone in town goes to that thing, um, regardless of what part of town you're from. Or you know, it, it is it is something that connects the entire community. Um, and you know, we do a lot of community engagement work at United Way, and, and I look at it as where we all want to be. Um, and and I speak on behalf of not just a funder, but anybody who's in this community. So. Um, we're super proud of the work uh, that uh, that Book Harvest is doing. Um, I mentioned our investment in Book Harvest. It's not nearly enough, and every community needs a 
book harvest uh, in their community. Um, and uh, we're just so, so proud to be a part of it. Wonderful. Thank you, Eric, for sharing. Uh, love, love all the photos and, and just these examples of communities being connected, families and, and kids engaging together. Um, and I also happen to be a member of the Ginger Young fan club as well. <laughs> You can't possibly not be a member no, of the Ginger. We're, we're all part of the Ginger uh, Mutual Admiration <laughs> Society for sure. Um, <laughs> Thank you for sharing and, and just for your, your investment um, in this organization and, and so many others to make this work possible. All right, Brian, uh, great to have you here today. You're with the Robert, Robert M. McCormick Foundation. Uh, would you be able to provide us with a glimpse of what uh, your foundation is doing to promote healthy Learn early learning and development in Chicago's everyday spaces. I think you're muted, Brian. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was unmuted there. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Jane. Uh, great to uh, great to be here and, and great to have a chance to talk about um, our work uh, in Chicago. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So Robert R. McCormick Foundation is really focused on, uh, I'd say, folks entirely in Illinois and folks especially in Chicago. Uh, and particular communities in Chicago that have been historically under-resourced. And so our kind of framing for our education work is ensuring that children in Chicago have access to quality early education programs, birth through kindergarten, and that children really have the opportunity to start kindergarten ready to thrive in school environments designed for their success. Uh, next slide. Um, and so we think about this and sort of, um, you know, thinking about the child at the center, um, this originally wasn't red. It's an interesting uh, background here now. But um, you know, thinking of the child at the center, thinking about who are the the adults who positively impact that child's development. Um, you know, parents and guardians, educators and leaders, and then how do we support the communities those children and their families are a part of, as well as the systems that sort of undergird uh, and impact um, the resources they have available to them, uh, the programs they can take part in, uh, and the resources in their community. And so um, we look at our strategies kind of fitting in, um, you know, within families and communities fitting in three buckets. So we think about, um, you know, how do we support parents and guardians as their child's first teacher? And then how do we think about, you know, thinking of sort of the model of um, in a, an early child classroom, the environment being the third teacher? How do we think about the community as being the third teacher? And so in, um, in our family community work, uh, we really focus on saturation, community assets, and then direct parent support and engagement. Uh, so in, you know, give a few quick examples. I know we're, uh, we're behind on time, but uh, so in saturation, we think about how do we support embedding positive parenting strategies throughout a community. Uh, so for example, we've been able to work with um, a partner in DeKalb County, the DeKalb uh, Regional Office of Education. They're a unit of local government, but they've been a powerful um, advocate for high quality early learning in their community and statewide. Um, so they're leading uh, work called Basics Illinois. So they're bringing uh, the basics model that started as the Boston Basics, bringing it across Illinois. Uh, and what they've been able to do in DeKalb County is really embed the basics throughout their community. So if you walk into um, the public health department, which I think they said, I think half or more of families visit in their child's first year, um, you're seeing books, you're seeing um, you know, the basics principles, you're getting a pamphlet um, tuned to your child's age and development um, about um, strategies, activities, ways to help stimulate your child's development. Uh, and that's kind of throughout their whole community. And so they're helping communities across Illinois do that same work. Um, you know, they're working in public parks, creating toddler gardens. So um, we're really excited about thinking about how we uh, continue to embed um, that throughout various communities across the state. Um, we also engage in direct supporting direct parent uh, support and engagement. So we work with the uh, Behavioral Insights and Parenting Lab at University of Chicago. Um, they've created a text messaging program called Chat to Learn. Uh, and so the idea here is that parents sign up, they get these text messages, they get age appropriate prompts, insights, activities, et cetera, that they can use their children in any setting. Uh, and then uh, next, next slide, um, you know, as some other of my peer funders here in the call have also done, um, you know, we've been supporting uh, playful learning landscapes. And so we work with our Chicago Children's Museum to uh, help transform ordinary spaces into places for play. Uh, and so for example, in the North Lawndale community on Chicago's west side, um, 
the most recent installation was in a uh, family community resource center, which is where families access a range of public benefits like WIC and SNAP. Um, if you go into the waiting room there, you know, before standard waiting room, lots of chairs, not a whole lot. That's very exciting for families. Um, you know, now there are activities focused on literacy, focused on social emotional learning that, um, you know, parents and children together can engage in. Um, but also that children can engage in independently. So it's really promoting promoting learning, promoting interaction. Um, we've also partnered with the museum on uh, a recent initiative called Curiosity Classrooms that is all about transforming vacant spaces at neighborhood schools that maybe um, you know, have been under enrolled. And how do we how do we boost those schools and make them uh, community assets? And so they're transforming those spaces into classrooms focused on promoting you know science, technology, arts, math, um, for children in pre-K to second grade, uh, for their educators, for families that they're using throughout the day. Um, and so that's really a core principle of ours, just thinking about how are we supporting community assets and transforming spaces. I think that's uh, the end of my slides there. <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. Appreciate all these great examples as well. Uh, now I'd love to uh, move on to um, the, our next question. And even just with your quick introductions, it's just clear that this is just truly powerful, engaging and impactful work. Um, and now I'd love to hear a little bit more about the why. Um, what sparked your respective foundations to, to work to embed learning opportunities into these laundromats, into playgrounds, bus stops, um, and other everyday places? Uh, so we'll dive into the why now in, in reverse order, uh, actually staying with you, Brian, to kick us off. All right. So back up. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I would say um, a few things. So I, I think, you know, this has been a strategy that um, precedes me, um, but that I've been very excited about and continue to support. I would say we're really thinking about, you know, a lot of our work is supporting, as I mentioned, the systems. Um, you know, policy advocacy, funding, et cetera, as well as formal or formal early learning settings um, like home visiting centers, et cetera. But then the missing piece is where are those spaces where um, A, families are already spending most of their time, um, you know, which is at home or elsewhere in the community. Um, where are spaces where children might otherwise be bored, waiting, expect to sit still? Um, how can we turn those into learning spaces? Um, and learning opportunities. Um, for example, one of our playful learning installations is across from a food pantry. Families are often waiting, um, either maybe long lines. And so that's an, an instant opportunity for um, learning. Um, we're also thinking about where are places that families visit on a regular basis where we can create learning opportunities. Um, one of our le playful learning installations is a, um, a math house along a boulevard in the North Lawndale community. And so it's down the street from a school and, and there are you know, families that pass by it every day uh, as they're taking older siblings to school, younger siblings have this consistent uh, learning opportunity in their lives. Uh, and then you know, also where are there places where um, creating learning opportunities enhances the work that's already happening for families. And so thinking about the health department in DeKalb, um, you know, that's a natural place where you know, doctors, nurses, health counselors, et cetera, and enhance the learning that's offered by the, the basics. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, Eric, would you like to go next? Uh, yeah, Brian and the McCormick Foundation <laughs> have some really great uh, framings for, uh, for the why. And uh, I would just say from my own personal background, I spent an awful lot of time as a, as a teacher and working with teachers and working with leaders and working inside the schools uh, and that obviously is is crucial and important. Um, but as I think Brian was articulating, uh, you know, kids and families spend most of their time outside of the classroom. And um, and yeah, I think the answer to why we would invest in those spaces is because that's where the kids are, <laughs> and that's where the families are, and um, and that's where uh, the learning continues. So I really uh, liked in in uh, Brian's uh, slide about how he was saying that the environment is is the teacher. And, and so how uh, we can invest in that environment to make it a more beautiful space. I believe it was uh, Amanda's slides that showed the before and after of the laundromat. And when, if we can enhance those, those spaces and turn them into, uh, turn them from mundane spaces into joy spaces, and then you associate that with reading and literacy, I think that's the ball game. So um, 
to use a baseball analogy, uh, Jane, uh, you know, Jane's got a, a budding baseball star. So I'm, 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 uh, yeah, I can. Thank you, Eric. And, and yeah, I can, I can relate just from being in these spaces and observing kids, you create that environment and they, they run in and they know what to do. You know, this is, this is what they naturally do. And so it's just kind of creating that environment for them. Yeah. It's not a formal space. It's a place yeah. to go. Play. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Beth, you shared some wonderful examples before, uh, but if you could share, share with us a little bit about the why. Sure. I, I think for us, the why is about, um, really fostering and strengthening a sense of community mm -hmm. uh, so that we, we truly are looking at our children in the region as our children, not as other people's children. I think one of the things that surprised me early on in this work is we have so many wonderful, talented professionals who are working in this space in a silo that they, they, didn't know each other, didn't know the work that other organizations were doing, and in many cases saw each other as competition for what they perceived, you know, as being limited dollars. So as we've been trying to, to foster that sense of sharing and, and um, to really make uh, our opportunities opt-in opportunities to get rid of that sense of um, competition and to uh, allow the professionals working in the space to get to know each other as human beings. Um, I have a, a sign on the, the wall outside my office that says change happens at the speed of trust. And I think the, the second part of that is trust happens as a result of shared experiences. So the more that we can um, have shared experiences in our community centered around really positive experiences for parents and children to have together um, and to foster that ecosystem where, where, where we're working with our friends in the community to do something special. It, it becomes greater than the the sum of our parts and for for us that's really what it's about fostering that widespread community participation um and uh, allowing um the strengthening of individuals organizations and as a result the community thank you beth uh all right perry um, thanks for this question. I mean, I would echo everything that Brian's saying around um, going to where families are and Eric as well. And Beth, certainly, you know, um, thinking about how to incorporate community into all the work that we're doing to really surround a child. Um, you know, for us, we think a lot about um, how we can get what we know around the brain science. Um, uh, and the kind of developing brain for children at, at that age into the hands of parents and caregivers, right? So our program was started by um, Secretary Hillary Clinton, um, who has been an early learning champion for her whole life. And, you know, in 1997, had um, convened the first conference on early childhood development and learning. Um, and, you know, she was struck 20 years later that there was still so much that we know about this ever growing body of research um, about young children's early brain and language development. And, um, you know, really felt like how can we incorporate this into our engagement with families in really easy ways that, you know, encourage what they're already doing around talking, reading, singing with their children. So as we think about our work, we're always thinking about how can we go to them? How can we um, embed some of these messages to um, demonstrate how important what it is that they're already doing is for their child's, you know, kind of brain development and um, and growth? Um, and then, you know, certainly this coupled with the knowledge that um, preschool children spend so much time outside, you know, their waking hours, engaging in informal learning experiences. This was kind of coupled together with uh, what we know around the brain science. So that was, that's a bit of the why for, for our program. Great, thank you, Perry. And Amanda can close out this question. Thanks. Um, within our early childhood work, the foundation is focused on early literacy, getting kids ready for school and making sure that they're reading on grade level by the end of third grade. Um, and about six, 
seven years ago, we learned of the Playful Learning Initiative from Kathy Hurst Pasek. And we really see um, literacy rich environments as a complement to our other early childhood focused work, which is why we integrated it into our strategy. Um, so it really complements the work we're doing to increase the quality of early childhood centers and the parenting supports like home visiting that we're also supporting. By including playful learning in our funding portfolio, as you kind of heard Brian mention, we're supporting early learning in the spaces and places where children and families really spend the majority of their time. Wonderful. Thank you, Amanda. All right, uh, now we'll move on to the to, the, to our next question. Um, people often think of funders as investors, uh, but we know that philanthropy plays many, many roles, but beyond that of, of writing a check. Um, and we've seen some examples here today, but let's talk a little bit more about the, the how. Uh, what roles are you playing to promote uh, learning rich environments? And I'd love to know if those roles evolved over time based on, on what you were learning and, and what was needed. So Amanda, I'll, I'll bring it back over to you. <laughs> sure. Um, so in addition to supporting the design and fabrication of literacy rich spaces, we're all, we've also included funding for a robust community engagement process in all of the projects we've supported. Um, you kind of heard Perry mention the importance of community engagement, but it's really important to us that the spaces reflect the surrounding community's needs and values. So we include funding in the projects we support to ensure that the community is compensated for their time and expertise. Um, we also provide funding to convene the organizations, researchers, and evaluators involved in this work to share what's working, the challenges that are coming up, and to brainstorm potential solutions together. Um, these conversations have definitely evolved over time. <laughs> We've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't over the past you know, seven years. Um, and the benefit of these convenings is that we have organizations who've been doing this work for seven years alongside organizations who are brand new to this work. And it really helps with the knowledge sharing. Um, and more recently, we've begun working with grant makers for education to expose more funders to literacy rich environments and playful learning. Um, and anyone interested in learning more is welcome to contact me. Great, thank you, Amanda. I know when, when we had worked together, I particularly um, appreciated just the, the connections that um, your foundation made and helping to forge these partnerships, as Beth was saying, uh, uh, rather than kind of being viewed as competitors in this space or um, and, and siloing uh, sectors and organizations, um, bringing bringing organizations through to to these convenings and uh, finding creative ways to to work together. Um, it's such a such a positive impact. So thank you. All right, uh, Perry, love to hand it over to you now. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll share two things. The first is kind of building on um, what Amanda had shared around the convening power. I mean, I think that's been a real gift for us to be able to learn from so many amazing organizations. One of the things that we think about, too, as we're thinking about convening is how we may be able to bring um, together leaders from um, different sectors. So some of our convenings have, in, while included philanthropic supporters, also um, try to um, include uh, early, early education, um, um, business leaders, civic leaders, really to kind of share ideas um, to both support sustainability, but also, you know, kind of work really richly with the with, with the whole community. Um, and then, you know, in addition to convenings, I think we've been in the really lucky position to have some incredible funders who um, not only bring us together and connect us with other grantees, but also, um, you know, who provide a lot of thought partnership and space for um, space for uh, planning and, you know, thinking kind of through uh, how uh, how we can do a project. So that to me is kind of um, is is when we can work together closely is the, the best projects kind of come to fruition from that. Well said. Couldn't couldn't agree more, Perry. Thank you, uh, Beth. There we go. Had a little trouble finding my cursor. Oh, welcome back. <laughs> um, I I think it, we share many roles um, mm -hmm. here. Certainly, convener, uh, bringing people together. I also think of 
our work is a little bit of matchmaking um, to really um, help our community members understand that they don't have to be the entire solution all by themselves, but they can play a part in the solution. For, for example, with Remake Learning Days, we think of every day, um, every event as being a triangle that you need an appropriate space for the event to happen. You need high quality content um, that has that hands-on component, but then you also need the audience. And you know, we, we had several churches that participated with us this year that had the audience and had the space, but didn't necessarily feel like they were the expert in the content. And we, we were able to match them with community organizations that had the content, but perhaps didn't have the space in the audience. So being that matchmaker and being the, the convener. And then we also take a training component on as well so that uh, anyone who's participating with us is having the opportunity to strengthen their team in program content, in marketing, in effective use of social media to tell your story before, during, and after your event. And um, I, I think cheerleader as well. One of the things that um, makes me so happy about the, the work that we've been involved in is we're starting to see partnerships that are flourishing outside of Remake Learning Days and connections that have been made within the community that have great benefits that have very little to do with um, the specific work that we're doing. So it's, it's a real sign that that ecosystem is um, thriving with just a little, little loving care from us in the beginning. I love that. Thank you, Beth of philanthropy playing the role, not just as, as funders, but also cheerleaders and matchmakers. <laughs> All right, uh, Eric. Uh, thanks for this question, Jane. And, and we do a lot of thinking about this at United Way of the Greater Triangle. Uh, we work with leaders across the spectrum. And um, yeah, I mentioned Tabitha Blackwell and Ginger Young, the, the founder and uh, executive director. Of, of book harvest. And I think it's really easy to crown uh, the leaders who are doing this work um, without necessarily uh, supporting them to do the work. Or uh, I think it was Beth who said, you know, moving at the speed of trust. One of the things that this United Way and a lot of United Ways haven't caught up to us, but we really eliminated um, a lot of the bureaucracy, most of which that can be found in a 990 uh, that, that United Ways were kind of famous of. Like nine, it, we literally had like a 90 point checklist when I started a few years ago. And that all that does is, is box out uh, the folks that are closest to community and uh, maybe doing some really good work. We don't want this to be a grant writing contest. We want, obviously we have to have a process and a system by which we, we choose. And then Regardless of whether they're getting money from us or not, we're committed to investing, convening, and amplifying those voices, uh, particularly um, those underrepresented populations. And, you know, this is not a sustainable profession right now. Um, this is not what we're here to talk about today, but um, we we work with a, with a cohort of, of of leaders who uh, are doing heroic work in the in the black uh, birthing people space, and every one of those leaders themselves have been to the hospital within the last year um, because everybody's out there playing hero ball, and it's not sustainable. And and I think, I don't mean to be dour here, but like we have to take this seriously and not just crown people and say you know. Ginger has, you know, built Book Harvest out of her basement it's a, or out of her garage. And, and those are those are great stories. And funders like us love those stories. But what are we doing as funders to sustain that, to sustain that equity and leadership and really make this a sustainable profession uh, for the long haul? And I think Beth uh, and, and Amanda can, and, and Perry just just laid out some great strategies to do that. But it's just so important that we're that we're taking care of uh, the people who are doing this work. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, Brian. Well, it's hard to go last in this group. I think everything's been, <laughs> been covered. Um, I, I would say, I think, you know, to, to Beth's point about sort of being, um, you know, matchmakers and cheerleaders, I, I think that that's probably a role that I, I see we've been able to play, especially because we have a, a really a place-based focus. And so thinking about what are promising things that are happening that, you know, ideas that people have, um, 
programs people are developing at a citywide or statewide level, and how can we leverage the resources and connections that we have, um, you know, in communities with often, you know, it can be smaller or less prominent um, organizations. How can we make sure that they're at the table as co-designers of um, things that are going to be happening in their community? And how do we make sure that they're at, they're at the beginning really um, as equitable partners? Uh, and how can we also ensure that, um, you know, the communities that we're focused on can take advantage of resources that are happening? Uh, that, you know, there's really meaningful collaboration happening so that people who are already connected to families are connecting those families with resources like text messaging, like, um, you know, community-based um, resources. Um, so, uh, yeah, not a whole lot I can add there, but I think the matchmaking piece is what resonates with me. Thank you, Brian. Um, all right. Well, uh, you've all been clearly investing in this work um, for, for, for a few years now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the results you're seeing? What kind of impact are these efforts having on children and families and um, on the partners who are, who are engaged in this work with you? Brian, I'm going to hand it back over to you and go to our work. Um... <laughs> Make it easy. I say a few things. I, I saw um, a question, I think, in the chat about, um, you know, kindergarten assessment scores and what impact are we seeing on third grade, you know, scores, et cetera. And I think that, you know, looking at sort of the projects that we've invested in that have this community wide focus, one of the things that um, has been a learning, I think, for us has been just the need for persistence and patience that um, it, it's, it takes a very long time, I think, to see change in some of those traditional measures um, you know, that we've been used to looking at, especially when we're thinking about an intervention happening at a community-wide level. Um, and, and so you know, we may not immediately or even in three, four years see that you know, we can draw a straight line from that intervention to a change in test scores. But what I do think we were able to see is joy, excitement. Um, we're able to see, you know, I think about I mentioned, um, you know, the math house that we built in, um, you know, North Lawndale, working with other other funders um, as a part of our playful learning work. Uh, and the first time I visited that, there was, um, you know, I, I mentioned sort of, you know, people who are, you know, younger siblings dropping off older siblings. Um, you know, there was a mom, you know, with her her young daughter. I think it was like three, and she said, you know, she comes, she insists that we come here every day. Uh, and so there's this sort of joy, and there's this, um, I think, level of um, excitement about something being built in a community that maybe has not had resources being added, resources being brought, um, but also starting to really think about those spaces that have been underutilized now becoming community assets. There's value in that. There's value in investing in, um, you know, in sort of learning in a community. Um, I also think, you know, to, to the earlier question, there's a lot of change that's happening and impact that's happening in terms of, you um, sort of unlikely partners and, and, you know, organizations working together, organizations that, um, you know, maybe are larger, having partners that are working closer to um, two families and working at a community level, partnerships that otherwise wouldn't happen if it wasn't for these kinds of efforts. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, we're on to our final question now, and we're going to do something a little different. We're going to you can popcorn your answers. So in no particular order, whoever feels compelled to, to share first, given what you know now, after having been at this for a while, uh, what, what advice would you offer to other funders who are listening into this conversation and, and getting inspired by, by what you're sharing? I, I know I'm certainly getting inspired, but what, what advice would you offer to, to other funders? Um, mine would be not to arrive with the answer, mm -hmm. um, arrive and be very curious and and try to find out what the assets are that that individual or organization is bringing to the table and and being creative on on how that might work um, for the whole. I, I think many of the things that that have happened and we've received traction um, with are things that you know, have evolved and they've e evolved by pulling together um, the very willing to to work on it and then doing things in such a way that it becomes attractive uh, to others. 
So I, I think talk to everybody, be willing to meet with everyone, be willing to have the conversation. And um, another piece of advice would, would be that it isn't always the organizations that are doing it the best that need support. It's the organizations that maybe really have a desire to get better at what they're doing, but they don't see the path forward. Um, so to to provide opportunities for the entire water level to rise rather than just award the, the folks who are already doing it well. Thank you, Beth. And my apologies, but Brian, what you had shared was so compelling. I, I was so moved and then skip right to the next question without um, allowing others to respond. So we're actually gonna go back to that and then go back to the advice, so apologies. Um, Amanda, would you be able to share, um, go back to um, sharing about some of the results you're seeing and the impact um, the effort your efforts are making? Sure, um, so I'll, it's a nice kind of continuation from what Brian was saying. Um, it's It's been challenging to assess this work at the, at the community level. So we've really been focusing on outcomes um, such as number of conversational turns, um, the amount of like letter, number, spatial language used. Um, and I, a key focus of our work really has over the past couple of years been to help establish a proof of concept for literacy rich environments and playful learning to really help prove that, that these spaces can contribute to children's learning and development. Um, and I would say like we're really proud that um, that the pilot evaluations from Philadelphia and evaluations from across the country have really contributed to that proof of concept to show that these these environments can work. Um, and I would say, in addition to focusing on on child outcomes, I would say another key piece of our evaluation work has been a focus on continuous quality improvement. So it's it's helpful to know how these environments impact one community's set of children and families. Uh, but the lessons learned from each project inform the next. Um, so we're really continuously learning about how to do, to do this work a little better every single time, which is incredibly helpful to, again, improving those child impacts and child outcomes. Wonderful. Thank you, Amanda. Perry. Sure. So um, I, was, I, I really appreciated Brian talking about the joy and excitement that children get from these spaces and just um, what that means for community. I also, you know, in Too Small to Fail, we've done about 16 different evaluations of the strategies that I was mentioning before in terms of trading trusted messengers and, um, you know, transforming these spaces. And I mean, ultimately, we really try to use all of that evaluative uh, data to do things do more of what works <laughs> and leave behind some of the things that don't work. Um, you know, but in addition to, you know, some of what we've learned, um, uh, we're able to kind of lean into specific strategies that I could just talk really briefly about. Um, the first is that while the high quality resources and place-based approaches um, are really important important to our work. The trusted messengers are really our secret sauce, right? Like we have transformed a number of different uh, laundry mats in different spaces. And when a librarian walks in, it's like the whole room kind of enlivens, especially when the librarian is from the community and or is a recognizable person um, to the families. You know, like these are the things that have really made, um, made a, a lot of our spaces sing. Um, I also think, and this kind of connects to this, the second question you asked, Jane, around um, around sharing information with uh, other funders, but what we found is that these strategies can really prove impactful beyond literacy, that our initiatives that focus on early math or they focus on social emotional development um, have demonstrated strong effect efficacy. So if we are incorporating some of what we learn, um, you know, around early literacy into some of these other topics or the agent, the motivations of our partner organizations, the impact gets that much greater. Um, and so that's also really exciting for us because it means that we can partner in mutually beneficial ways and that much more deeply. Um, so I'll stop there, but um, I, I feel like I could go on and on because we've learned a lot of lessons that, um, you know, and we've, and we, uh, I think Sarah is going to put in a link to all of our evaluations in case anyone is interested in, in some of, in some of what we've done over the last 10 years. Great. Thank you. All right, Eric. 
you can share some about, uh, tell us about the results and impact. Well, as Brian was saying, it's it's tough to follow this group. So uh, <laughs> I'm feeling, I'm in that sandwich right now. Um, what, I don't have too much to add to uh, anything, any of the great data that my colleagues have shared, but I, I would say that one thing, one partnership that we're embarking in that we're pretty excited about is with the Stand Together Foundation. They're doing something called Customer First Measurement um, that measures net promoter score, net empowerment score. And it isn't, it's actually connected to the folks that are actually receiving the services that are that are doing that, that survey um, in, at a quarterly level. Um, so that's been a really interesting partnership for us and, and something that I think um, having spent a lot of time in, in data and when you're looking at as Brian was saying, the sort of things like test scores and all that, all really important stuff, but but it's hard to make the direct correlations. Um, I'm really glad to hear about Perry and Amanda's um, work that their foundations are doing. I'd, I'd love to get a look at those studies, but that, that's something that we're excited about is that customer first measurement piece. That's great. Thank you, Eric. Okay, now we're really going to go back uh, to the the advice question. Um, Beth loved what you shared about arriving with curiosity. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that. Is there anything else you would like to add? I would just like a, a chance to talk a little bit about the re results um, mm -hmm. that we're seeing. I, I think one of the things that we use as a measurement tool is are we building that widespread community involvement. And what I, I can say is what we're seeing is that everything becomes easier the more people we have involved in it. So um, from our work with uh, Remake Learning Days and our Suncoast Summer Reading Challenge and our attendance awareness um, work, we put forth an opportunity in the community uh, earlier this year that if organizations wanted to get a group of six people or more together to uh, read a book about uh, early childhood and meet four times to talk about it. And with very little work on our part, we had more than 90 book circles and more than a thousand people in the community that were willing to gather four times to talk about the importance of early learning. And all of that happens because everything feeds on what came before it. So I, I think once you get the, the snowball rolling to continue to see how you can widen and deepen the work at the same time. Wonderful, thank you, Beth. All right. Sorry, Anyone? I didn't you up. No, just... thank, you for, thank you for going back to that. <laughs> Would anyone like to chime in with advice for other funders who are listening? Uh, well, only thing I would share, um, you know, thinking of our experience, especially with um, playful learning, is thinking about the funder role. Um, you know, I, I think that, especially with initiatives that really start with a lot of funders and a lot of funder support, I think there's a need to be very intentional about um, how do funders then step away and, and how does um, how does it become a project that's owned by a responsible organization, a passionate organization, an organization with the infrastructure to carry it out? Uh, and then how is their ongoing um, you know, engagement of people in the community, you know, organizations that are embedded in, in that community who really then have ownership and, and not like a nebulous idea of like community ownership, but really that there is clear ownership, that there's clear responsibility for maintenance of physical assets. Um, I think that's something we're still, we made a lot of progress, you know, in and are still figuring out is how do we make sure the funder role is really one that's appropriate and that we're empowering and not overbearing. Yeah, I, th I think, I think Beth said something that was really powerful about being, staying curious um, and being curious, being curious and, um, you know, our net promoter score with our funded partners was 80. So obviously that's really strong data. Um, and I can tell you that the way that we've done it is we've showed up and listened, not showed up and, you know, we're not, we're not overseers, we're, we're partners. And, and I, it's easy to say it's really hard to do. And I think there's a tendency sometimes to not think you're going to be welcomed in these spaces. And sometimes, you know, these conversations might be uncomfortable or, or harder and they take more time. 
but just getting out and, and getting shoulder to shoulder with community, asking questions, um, you can separate yourself pretty quickly, I think, um, by just being that that physical presence in, in the lives of these leaders. That's great. Thank you, Eric. Something I've learned is that this work falls in a continuum and it can look like a leaders rich environment can be as simple as paint and chalk on a sidewalk or can look a much more expensive play structure. And I think the amazing thing with this work is that both of those examples can contribute to children's learning and development. Um, so I would really encourage all of the funders on this call to partner with their communities to find the approach that works best for them. And I think it's helpful to know that there are organizations out there who can help you get started, um, like Kaboom, like the Playful Learning Landscape Action Network, and like Too Small to Fail. Um, so want to want to share that piece of advice. Thank you, Amanda. It's such a great point about just the range of, of options and opportunities. All right. Anybody else like to share before we move to, to Q and A? All right. Seems like we have quite a few questions here. I'll start with the first one uh, from <clears throat> David Lowenstein. Hi, David. Um, I deeply admire Too Small to Fail's efforts in years past to encourage the creative community in Hollywood to incorporate early childhood development and public service storylines into content. Any updates on the strategy or plans to, to re-engage the creative community? Um, thanks, David, for that question. Um, yeah, as, as David was saying, you know, we um, many years ago, as part of our Talking is Teaching Talk, Read, Sing campaign, worked with Hollywood creatives and content producers to incorporate early learning messages into popular television, um, which appeared in a number of uh, really fantastic shows like Orange is the New Black and uh, Law and Order SVU, where you see families engaging with their children and talking to, you know, talking, reading, singing uh, during all of the different moments of their day. Um, and it was a really incredible campaign. Um, and it's uh, such a timely question that you asked this because we actually just received some funding to work again with um, content writers, um, actually with a lens on um, the brain development of children and the impact of climate change on that brain development. So we're going to be taking, um, and we just finished a, a narrative playbook that we're going to be taking to Hollywood to work with um to executives and content creators to really think about how, you know, the brain development of children are, are being impacted right now by, um, you know, by all of the different environmental factors that um, that affect their, their growth. So um, I'm happy to share a little bit more about with, you know, about that project offline, but we have seen that, you know, working with popular media to be extremely effective, um, both in some of our work with content creators, but also in our work with Univision. Um, and, you know, always thinking about kind of that echo chamber so that we have people on the ground, we have billboards, we have media, we have, you know, all of the PSAs on radio stations, um, really working together to kind of uh, meet families where they are. Great, thank you, thank you, Perry. Um, I was wondering if any of the other panelists may want to also respond to David's question about um, just potential partnerships with PBS Kids and local stations to cultivate learning. I know um, one or more of you have probably, probably partnered with local PBS stations before. Well, I, I can say that uh, PBS Kids has been a tremendous partner with us with uh, Remake Learning Days events, providing content, um, hosting their own events, being at other people's events. They um, have terrific educators who are willing to work on lesson plans and really help to train the the event hosts and all. So it's, it's been a very positive experience. And when, quite honestly, I was afraid to call them because I thought they would, you know, think we were small potatoes and not want to, not want to engage. And that wasn't the case at all. They, they couldn't have been more wonderful. Thank you, Beth. If I, if I can, I'll, I'll, I'll just add that we um, funded our local PBS station, WHYY, 
um, to create two children's television shows, one for children ages like um, zero to three and one for like three to eight um, that recently debuted. They're actually available for free on YouTube. Go to WHYY. Um, but they all featured like local Philadelphia landmarks and um, artist organizations and um, local institutions that are just like famous here. Um, so I was really excited to have local children and families kind of celebrated on these television shows. And it was a really nice partnership. Wonderful. Thank you, Amanda. Um, all right, we have a question from Anna. I'd love to keep learning how CGLRs and that of your partners here and beyond work focus on school readiness and school success connects with early relational health and the degree to which school readiness success challenges can, to an extent, resolve when parents have less stress through economic supports, when caregivers know child development, when kids can develop good social skills and relationships, and when social isolation is reduced. Would anyone like to answer that question? I'm happy to take a stab. <laughs> I, I think that's a great question. I think that, um, you know, thinking about the the work that uh, I think that all of us have described, you know, thinking about our work in here in Illinois around really strengthening that parent-child relationship, um, you know, I think that's a part of it, I think, in terms of supporting, um, you know, bonding between parents and children, providing parents with tools, especially new parents, um, you know, with tools, prompts, ideas about, you know, ev everyday things, so sort of making it less stressful. I think there are so many, you know, products out there that, you know, parents, you've got to have these flashcards and, you know, this product and all of that, and really making it as simple and, and less stressful as possible. Um, but I will also say thinking about how do we pair it, uh, and, you know, part of what we support, and I'm sure others on here support, is, um, you know, some of our early learning programs with uh, comprehensive family support, um, you know, because I think the other part of this is there's only so much you can do with the environment. Parents also really do need those tangible supports. They need uh, people to help them, uh, you know, set and achieve ambitious goals, connect to resources, um, you know, get over and get past um, barriers that they're facing. So I think that combination is key, but I definitely see, um, you know, a role for this kind of um, community focused work, helping people build those stronger bonds. Great, thank you, Ryan. All right, we have a, another really great question here from Surinder Sharma. How often do the foundations look for new solutions, initiatives in reading and literacy? What are the top three aspects? What are the top three aspects of an initiative that make it worth funding? And are there other supports such as volunteers made available by your organization in addition to funding? Thank you for that question. Um, we have a, it's not a direct literacy program, but I think it's worth noting. Um, we have a program that we call the Triangle Tend to Watch. And um, sorry, there's yard work being done outside, so sorry for the noise. Um, and um, we fund up and coming leaders under a million dollars in terms of their overall revenue, given leadership development and support. We invest obviously financially in them. And we've seen some really incredible results, uh, kind of rocket hockey stick kind of growth in terms of their impacts, the number of people served. And these are often leader, these are leaders of color and or women uh, that we focused on. And we've with with many of the organizations that we funded over the last six years, we've seen growth of like we've seen tripling of growth. So I think just investing in that young leadership pipeline. Uh, and being really intentional about connecting the, the gingers of the world with that leadership pipeline is, is, is important. That's great. Thank you, Eric. Uh, anyone else have any thoughts on this question? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, I, I, I think as we talked about before, you know, the role of matchmaker and cheerleader and some, some of those different things, I think some of those um, other assets that she was talking about, like volunteers and, and that kind of thing. While we might not be the organization that is providing the volunteers, we do have the knowledge to be able to 
connect organizations with you know with what they're with what they're looking for that you know we we often talk about how if we're sitting at the table and there's something that we need that we collectively don't have it's time to invite somebody else to, to come to the table and you know to continue to look for the for those things so i think there's a a, a big opportunity um to de-silo and to to truly build an all-inclusive community. Wonderful. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Eric, question for you here. Love the three pillars of your work. Curious if United Way is involved in or open to exploring partnerships around two gen approaches. Yes, we certainly are. And we have um, invested in those things in the past. And um, I think being really intentional about making sure that we have enough funding to make it matter is important. Right. I think uh, I've seen two gen and place based work really well, um, but I we actually had to when I started we had to recover from sometimes spread around like peanut butter and you're, you're forcing yeah. marriages. That is not the way to do it. So um, so yes, we are we are we are uh, interested in, in two gen approaches for sure. Right. Um, all right. I think question. this question is probably for you, Brian. Um, what is a math house and how can we implement such a thing? Yeah, that's a great question. And I was like looking in the background here to see if I could find a photo because I would have been a great photo to include. Um, but I'll say, you know, this was a part of and I'm happy to like try to find some and send them later. Uh, a part of our math focused installation um, along a boulevard in the North Lawndale community. And so there are interactive um, math focused activities, outdoor activities. Uh, and one of them is sort of a, a house that has, I think there's musical instruments, there's some like counting games, there's some, uh, you know, sort of math rotating kinds of things. Um, but it's it's sort of a play, uh, yeah, like a physical playhouse that's all designed around math. And it's all um, either child directed or parent child activity. Uh, together, um, you know, math focused activities along with prompts for adults. So we'll definitely try to find some um, some photos of that one and share those. Great. Thank you. And any guidance on how how uh, math house can be implemented? Yeah, I, I would say, uh, you know, and I think Amanda probably has some great ideas around, around this as well. Um, you know, this was, you know, part of what the community sort of came up with and that our partner Chicago Children's Museum was able to implement. So I think, you know, each of our playful learning installations uh, is different because it, it kind of is in response to um, the space it's placed in as well as what that community and what sort of the, you know, there's an anchor organization in each community that, um, you know, engage parents, engage educators um, around, you know, what are the kinds of things you'd want to see? And so that then was turned into um, that design. And so I think it's, it's a combination of figuring out where is their space, what are the resources, um, what who's who's the anchor, who who's sort of the lead of that community that can engage authentically the voices of people in that community uh, and take ownership of of the installation there, and then having really an expert partner in our case the Chicago Children's Museum um, that can uh, design, implement, turn that idea into something tangible um, and durable and and meaningful as a um, as a whole experience. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's some plan, you know, in terms of the playful learning network uh, to sort of like accumulate and share blueprints and things like that. But um, yeah, I think we'd be happy to share what, what we've developed at least um, and, and you know, uh, at least, you know, share photos and ideas. Great, thank you, Brian. And, and just to follow up kind of more, maybe more logistical question for you or for others, were there city permits that were required and any other um, any other considerations here to um, uh, to implement and some of these kind of space based initiatives? Yeah, I'll share for us, and then I think you know um, would love to hear from others. I think our experience may be a little different than others. Um, so there was a requirement for permits, so there was a partnership with. Um, the Chicago Department of Transportation, because that location was on a boulevard, I would say I think about half of our, our installations required permits because they're in public spaces and about half um, are on, um, you know, in private spaces or indoors. Um, 
something as we're thinking about a next phase of this is we're really thinking about hoping hoping to learn from other cities. Um, you know, how do we have a different kind of partnership with park districts, with um, city agencies, so that um, the work that's happening in playful learning is is being done maybe in a more expedient way uh, through partnership with those organizations. Yeah, I would just add that oftentimes the community organizations we've supported are really good at engaging the community and coming up with a really like innovative creative design um, where they often need some technical assistance and some help is navigating that city permitting process, which can be extremely challenging if you've never done it before or even if you have. Um, so with a lot of our projects, like for the, the Play Everywhere Challenge, um, we had Kaboom was able to provide some of that technical assistance and they brought in an outside organization um, to cover things they, they couldn't, they didn't have the expertise in. Um, so they partnered with a, a local organization who was just an expert in that in that process and could really walk, like hold people's hands kind of through that, that entire process, which was really helpful. Um, so one of, that's kind of like one of our lessons learned is that um, up front, you should make sure that an organization has all of the resources they'll need to start that project from like beginning all the way through fabrication and installation. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Lucy, there are a few other questions here. Um, I work, Lucy Gilbert asks, I work at a Title I school in Georgia. I have the space, I have the audience. How do I find a partner? Any, any advice or thoughts there? There's so, so many ways that you could go about it. Um, one of the first things I would do if, if you're teaching in a Title I school is I would ask all the other teachers and support personnel at the school, who do they know in the area that you're looking um, for? You know, if you wanted to bring an arts or cultural or institution in for an event, or if you wanted to have, you know, a an on-site field trip or, or things like that to, to ask your inner circle first, you know, who do they know who knows somebody? And that's a great way to start. Um, but then also, you know, you, you can ask foundations in your area without asking for funding, you can ask for connections. And I think the, the thing is just not to be afraid to ask a question that, that you might get you know, a negative answer to because it, it's the answer will come to you in an unexpected way. Again, if you stay curious and and are willing to to wonder about what's possible. Thank you, Beth. Would anyone else like to chime in? Um, Amy had a question here. Hero Ball, love that comment. Are you referring to compassion fatigue and supporting the mental health needs of our advocates and servant leadership? What does that look like? And are there examples or what this uh, or what of what this could look like to ultimately scales and keep our leaders out of the hospital per se? Yeah, um, I I am not a mental health expert. I think certainly mental health uh, is a huge part of of, of this. Continuum. Uh, what I, I mean, these jobs are lonely, right? It's lonely to be an executive director of a small nonprofit. And I mentioned our tend to watch and, and our ability to convene leaders and sometimes with no agenda and just have them share space together and talk about, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily in the room. I'm usually not in a room. And, and I think just providing that space is, is really crucial. Um, and uh, sometimes it, it obviously is about um, a certain topic, like mental health might be one of them. But but that 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 ability for for leaders to to share ideas um, is something. I mean, we all do within our own organizations, right? We all have convenings where we we put leaders together, and I think too often we don't do that in in community nonprofit work. And we, you know, again, we might crown. Uh, someone like Ginger or Tabitha and not do enough to support them or to support the ecosystem that is gonna create uh, more of them. Um, so so that's that's what I mean by Hero Ball. Um, and, and too often, I think they, yeah, I think Beth did a great job of articulating um, to the, but to the, uh, to the teacher 
about how to stay curious, but like, you, you, and you can stay, you stay more curious when you're among others like yourself. And that's, that's why Beth immediately started with talk to your fellow teachers. Like, you, you know, but, it, but that is not something that is intentional. I can tell you walking schools for you know, decades, the idea of like walking across the hall and actually collaborating is not something that system is designed, is designed to do. And, and we as funders can help to create some of those ecosystems and those systems um, that prevent the burnout and prevent the hero ball and, uh, and create real, real uh, cultures of learning and, and, and expertise and, and where people can really thrive. Wonderful. Thank you, Eric. All right. We'll close with one final question here from Susan. Uh, states often braid federal and state education dollars. Have any of the foundations on this panel worked together to create greater impact in communities uh, by braiding their resources? Example, one foundation focused on early literacy, another supports young families. Another might provide literacy materials, not as separate initiatives, but, but as an intentional collective impact through an embedded community program. Um, I, can sp I can speak a little bit to that, um, Jane. Um, mm -hmm. So we do have some experience with working with Department of Education, both on the state and federal level. Um, we actually have a Michigan statewide campaign with funds that we received from the DOE. Um, to fund their Great Start Collaboratives, which are early learning centers throughout the state of Michigan. And um, one of the great things about um, our work with them is that we provided kind of the three strategies that I went over at the top of the webinar to each of the Great Start Collaboratives, and they customized their, um, their programs uh, according to what makes the most sense for their communities. Um, the state of Michigan, as you know, is quite rural in some areas, quite urban in other areas. So they were able to create tactics that work best for their communities. And I think what's really nice about that model is that the funding was started with the DOE, but each of those local counties found locally sourced funding, whether it be sponsorship from local business or a community foundation to kind of continue those efforts. And so now when you go to a community in Michigan, it's actually kind of hard to tell which came first or which funding is funding which part of the strategy. Um, and so um, that's when we feel like the, the, the key for us was the customization of that strategy, right? Like we went to some rural areas where a transit or like a bus shelter strategy with you know, early learning messages was not going to work because there's actually no transit system in that area, right? So we see that across the board. We're doing some similar work in Indiana with the in Department of Education, and we've done a lot of work also in California with Department of Social Services and kind of some of their state funding there. So um, happy to talk more about that with you um, if you reach out. But, you know, we we're always trying to think of that kind of uh, diversified revenue sources to support the work in a very ongoing and sustainable way. Wonderful. Thank you, Perry. And thank you uh, to our audience for all the, the terrific questions. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah. But before I do that, I, I had this thing at, at, at our house with the kids where something comes up and someone says something and we're like, wow, that could have, that could be like a really great bumper sticker. So as you were all talking, I, I did write some like bumper sticker notes um, that I just want to recap. And I was just really compelled by um, Perry, as you said, every, and, and this is by no means um, not to say that some of the other remarks weren't compelling, but every moment could be a magical moment. Um, embed, infiltrate, saturate, turning underutilized spaces into community assets philanthropy playing a role in investing, convening, and amplifying, fostering widespread community participation, creating meaningful connections, uh, serving as overseers, not as overseers, but partners, thinking about our work as matchmakers and cheerleaders, arriving and being curious, and last but not least, it's not my children or your children, it's our children. So thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. Thank you for allowing me to come with curiosity um, and learning from all of you and hope we can really continue all of this work. And thanks to, to everyone here today. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, thank team. You.
Yeah, thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you, Jane. I want to get all of your bumper stickers and post them all over the back of my car and be that person driving down the road. No, seriously, this has been an amazing conversation. I, we ran up to the end. I know we're over now, um, but I could have listened to y'all for another half hour. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll bring up really quickly um, the slides. If anybody is still interested in learning, you can sign back up and join uh, the next conversation that starts at 3 p.m. Eastern on family engagement strategies. We've got another great session for next Tuesday, um, and we'll be kicking off our uh, June with a kindergarten trend kindergarten matters session on transitions between pre-k and k followed by a crucible of practice session um, on june 11th and then quickly just want to make sure everybody knows that we have set the dates for uh glr week 2024 posted a link to this um in the chat stay tuned for some more details we'll be launching or sharing um, all of the different sessions and how you can register for those um, in the next two weeks. So stay tuned. Thank you all again. This has just been a great conversation. Um, such an important conversation, kind of how we can embed learning every single place that children and families go and make it magic, magical. Thanks. Have a great rest of your day.